So I think we should go ahead and start this. So welcome. Uh, my name is Sean Moore, and I'm the Director of Scholarship and Signature Programs at the ECU Alumni Association. And it's my great honor to you know, collaborate with NCLR to bring this wonderful event to life. And um, I'm so excited to hear all the readers. Uh, I was laughing that I am not a writer, but I'm definitely a reader uh, and lover of books. So I'm very excited uh, for y'all to be here. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful time. And I'm going to turn this over to Mary. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for tuning in to the North Carolina Literary Review's Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize Virtual Reading. My name is Mary Myers, and I'm an editorial assistant with NCLR. I'd like to thank Sean Holland Moore for being here tonight to tell us a little bit about the East Carolina Alumni Association, the co host of tonight's event, and for running the technology behind the scenes. Welcome to all of the Alumni Association members who are here tonight. From all of the students who produced the North Carolina Literary Review, we thank you for being here with us and supporting us. As graduate and undergraduate students, we have learned so much about what our relationship with ECU will be like after graduation. Also, welcome to our editor, Margaret Bauer, and senior associate editor, Christy Halberg, who are watching from their respective COVID retreats, and send thanks to you all for tuning in. Another big thank you to Alex Albright, who is watching tonight, the man who this award was named for. Our reading tonight not only celebrates the 2020 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize winners, but also the release of the NCLR Online 2021. You can find a link to our issue on our website at nclr.ecu.edu. Our online issue features both, both Hannah Towie and Glennis Redmond's pieces that you will hear tonight along with finalists in our James Applewhite Poetry Prize competition and Doris Betts Fiction Prize competition, an interview with Bell Boggs by Barbara Bennett, and reviews of over 50 new books by North Carolina writers. Find recommendations in these pages for what you'd like to read, fiction, poetry, memoir, or more. This reading should hold you over until the 2021 print issue, the 30th annual print issue of this award-winning ECU publication, is released this summer. To receive that, we hope you will subscribe. And if you subscribe this week, email us proof of your new or renewed subscription, and we'll send you a free 2007 issue featuring 100 years of writers and writing at ECU. Tonight, we will be joined by three readers who were honored in the 2020 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize competition, which is now open for submissions. The deadline is March 1st. Michael Parker is serving as final judge this year. We hope many of the listeners out there will submit their nonfiction for this competition, which has $1,000 in prize money to be divided among the winner and other finalists selected for publication. The Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize is open to any writer who is currently live, living in North Carolina, who has lived in North Carolina, or uses North Carolina as a subject matter. Submit previously unpublished creative nonfiction up to 7,500 words. There is no submission fee, but writers must either subscribe to NCLR or join the NC Literary and Historical Association, which provides funding to NCLR and the members of which receive subscriptions. For more information, you can go to our website and click submissions. Don't delay. As I say, the deadline is right around the corner, March 1st. Submit to the Alex all right competition this week and then send us an email saying you attended this event and receive a free copy of the 2019 issue featuring an interview with Glennis Redman, one of our readers tonight. Let us know if you already have that issue and we'll send you a 2016 issue with the first Alex Albright prize winning essay. So let's listen to some of those essays who were selected for publication last year. ECU student staff member Nija will introduce our first reader of the night. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Hello, my name is Nigel. And creative writing. She is 
She interned for the New York Times in the summer of 2020. Hannah has had her journalism published in the Raleigh News and Observer, the Greensboro News and Record, the Charlotte Post, WRAL, the Durham Herald Sun, and the Durham Voice. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Towie as she reads her first published creative writing piece and 2020 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Honorable Mention at the end of the causeway. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is my first published piece of creative writing, so it's really awesome to be here. Um, I'll just jump into it. Um, this is called At the End of the Causeway. The half mile strip of road connecting South Chatham to Morris Island is called the Causeway. There are no signs that say this, just local kids giving directions to tourists. Take a left at the end of the Causeway for Lighthouse Beach. They'll never tell you to take a right onto Edgewater Drive because that's a dead end. Unless you cut through some shrubs into outermost marina, closed now since last winter, when a storm built a sandbar too high for the water to pass. There's another dead end street on the opposite side of the causeway. Really, it's more of a long winding driveway for three small houses. The last house, number 52, is around where the Coast Guard's 13th life saving station was, whose national motto still lurks in the collective mind of the town fishermen. You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. The rear of the house looks over the marsh with around three acres of woods just outside the front. During the day, you can hear ducks and gulls, and at night, the hellish screams of coyotes and their prey, the sound of small things dying. That's the house where I live. Every new house on Morris Island has a wall built around it because people think the island will be underwater soon. The tide eats away at more of the beach each year, threatening to submerge the already thinning causeway. Every three months or so, there's a supermoon whose unearthly mass pulls high tide up to our car tires and to our toes. Maybe once every two years, the supermoon will coincide with a storm, each drop holding the potential for a citywide flood. On days like these, our road becomes a time machine, launching us into a future of two islands instead of one, a future without a causeway or barefoot kids running down it. Before June, there are only 6,196 people living in Chatham, Massachusetts. If you ask, they'll say they're from Cape Cod, make a muscle and point to their elbows, the funny bone of the island. Most local families come from the wives and daughters of fishermen. They grow up clamming in the winter, squid fishing in the spring and avoiding tourists in the summer and sharks in the fall. Out of the 6,000, almost all of them know the name Arthur Loomis, Poppy to us for different reasons. Some because he made it big by selling Chatham fish to restaurants in New York City, constantly telling stories of the days when Italian mobsters ran the Fulton fish market. Others will remember him for the speed at which he can finish the New York Times crossword delivered ceremoniously to his house on Edgewater Drive. A few others in town know him for his stint in the Marines or from Jersey. There's always someone who knows him from Jersey. During 9-11, most of us were living in Connecticut. That's where my mom and my aunt met my dad and his best friend who later became Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter was dyslexic, never a great student and consequently had a hard time landing a job out of school. Then he was hired at the World Trade Center a couple blocks away from my dad. A couple of years before the towers would fall, Uncle Peter made an extra thousand in cash by taking a bet to eat a cicada on the trading floor. I have this image of him standing on top of a table, dangling the roach over his gaping mouth, and then the building suddenly becomes engulfed in flames. In my head, he still eats the cicada. After Uncle Peter died, his wife and two daughters moved back up to Chatham hoping to cure their haunted dreams of smoke and fire with salt air. Uncle Peter doesn't have a grave here, just a rock with his name carved above the outline of a seagull. It is an unspoken understanding among my family that when you die, you have the option to remain on the island as a bird, 
shifting shapes within the protected coast of Morris Island. Uncle Peter would always be flying overhead and that was better than any gravesite or tombstone. Uncle Peter's rock sits in a garden next to our house on Desquantum Road, surrounded by bird feeders and nests woven from sticks and beach grass. That's where my dad was driving when he left Poppy's house on Edgewater Drive and hit 100 miles per hour on the half mile strip of concrete connecting us. It was a game reaching 100 on the causeway. Every now and then you'll hear an engine roaring across late at night and wonder if they made it to the end and if the speed took them to that place they so desperately needed to be. The causeway is the only place within walking distance of the public beach where you can park for free. You'll have to beat the clammers who park alongside the road when they're digging in Stage Harbor, so don't try to find a space at low tide. A few years ago, the town voted on whether or not to pave a parking lot over the marsh that grows around the causeway to make more room for the cars of summer tourists. Poppy knocked on doors for weeks that year, gathering petition signatures and rallying the support of local fishermen. Town Hall had never seen so many people, climbing over each other and lining every wall, all murmuring what to do about the causeway. They voted against the parking lot so we could walk to Poppy's house over wetland instead of concrete. Our frequent foot traffic softly flattens the grass like the deer who sleep in the marsh at night, thin legs folding neatly beneath their speckled underside. Poppy always taught us to look for hidden deer beds, rocky mussel clusters and osprey nests balancing between the cross of a light pole. By his kitchen window, there's a set of black binoculars to keep watch for the ospreys who return north every spring to the pole that marks the end of the causeway. Poppy never shared the same reverence for man as he did for these birds. Last year's storm unlocked a saddened anger I'd never experienced before as their nest was wiped away. He watched them every day for the seven years they lived together as neighbors. If the father flew home one evening without fish for dinner, we would know. And every summer we watched the chicks learn to fly. On some lucky mornings, I'd see them during a feeding and watch as the mama dangled bait over her chick's gaping mouths. They're trying to rebuild their nest, Poppy told me last summer, but it keeps blowing away. Like outermost marina, Poppy's pancreas was blocked by a lump that washed up one day, probably around the same time as the storm. He lived trapped alongside his fishing boat, both waiting for their sandbars to sink back into the sea or maybe for the life-saving service to finally reach them. Every time I walked down the road to Edgewater Drive, I wondered how much longer the causeway would lead me safely to his door. The Ospreys came back the day before he died as I anxiously attempted to solve the paper's crossword without him. Maybe I thought once I finished, he would wake up for good. I read each clue out loud every syllable containing a secret antidote and strained to see the completed puzzle that I knew was hiding between the morphine layers of Poppy's mind. But it was the ospreys that woke him up that day and I never could finish that crossword. I sat there pen in hand as my mom ran panting through his bedroom door. Dad, the ospreys are back. The birds peered through the kitchen window looking for Poppy cooking seafood soup or shucking oysters by the stove, ready at last to rebuild their nest at the end of the causeway. Poppy's eyes sprang open and I saw again how blue they were, translucent like low tide on those rare sunny winter mornings. What he said next was the last I heard from him. After days of muted slumber, his voice cracked into a relieved smile. I knew they'd come back. That's it. <laughs> Marvelous, marvelous. Thank you, that was my first reading. <laughs> I love to hear that. It's very exciting.
Thank you, Hannah, for sharing your essay with us. Remember, to read and savor this essay, you can find it in NCLR Online 2021. Hello, my name is Han Elizabeth Curran, and I am an intern with NCLR. Our next reader, Glennis Redmond, is the 2020 Alex Albright second place winner for On Beauty or A Reluctant Beauty Queen. Glennis has earned the title Road Warrior Poet because of how much she has read and taught poetry both in the U.S. and internationally. She is a Cave Conum Fellow, North Carolina Literary Fellowship recipient, Kennedy Center teaching artist, as well as a poet in residence at both the Peace Center for the Performing Arts in Greenville, South Carolina, and the State Theater in New Brunswick, New Jersey. You can read an interview with this writer in NCLR 2019, but tonight let's hear her read from her second place essay on beauty. Thank you for that and um, good evening everyone. And Hannah, that was beautiful. Thank you for the birds and the memorializing of your family. This uh, essay is called On Beauty, The Reluctant Beauty Queen. U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi, you ugly. You ugly, you absolutely ugly. As a cheerleader on the Woodmont High School cheering squad in, late, in the late 70s, early 80s, this was one of my favorite cheers to tease our opponents. It was not aimed after anyone in particular, but we chanted it all in good sport. It was a full throttle cheer to rouse the audience and the team for a win. While chanting the cheer, I never thought about its impact on me. Yet somewhere deep down, I believe the cheer lingered. It played to me as my own personal mantra. I began saying it to myself and taking it on. On the outside, no one would ever know that I felt this way about myself because I was well coiffed, well dressed and well shod. When I went to school, I was always well turned out because my mama was a seamstress. She made my dresses and skirt suits for homecoming court, talent shows, musicals, I designed, she sewed. No matter how good I looked on the outside, on the inside, I felt like a shabby street cat. No matter how wonderfully mama braided or straightened my hair, when I looked in the mirror, I felt ugly, absolutely ugly deep within. Being ugly was not a state that I concluded on my own. My father, Johnny Redman, had much to do with it. From him, I got negativity on top of negativity. I will never forget the day we were all sitting in the den in our duplex at McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. My dad looks at my oldest sister and says, Linda, you have eyes like diamond pools. In my nine-year-old eagerness, I asked my dad, what about my eyes? He says, yours are like mud puddles. The damage was done. Eyes like mud puddles. I waited for the punchline, waited for him to tell me he was joking, and he never did. Linus, Linus is what he called me because I carried a security blanket, because I did not feel safe. I wonder, in hindsight, I wonder if I carried a security blanket because I did not feel safe with him. Because of this belief, I walked around aching. Because of that depressing void within, I pushed myself in high school. I ran track. I was a regional all-conference and state champion. I was on the honor roll. I was a cheerleader. I had a lead in our school's Cinderella play. I was a dancer. I was junior class vice president. I was an avid book reader. For senior superlatives, I was voted best all around and most talented. I babysat starting when I was 12, worked as a cashier, a short order cook in the cafeteria at Michelin, packed and rewound tape at 3M as a summer hire. In other words, I was an overachiever. I also entered the Miss Woodmont contest because they had a talent competition. And I always wanted to stage, wanted a stage to showcase my dancing ability. That year, I did not place. It was the year of scandal when two girls were disqualified because their fathers had paid the judges off with $500. I was so outraged that I did not enter the pageant my last year. I was done with pageants. To get anywhere, I knew what I had to forge my own path. It wasn't always that way between my father and me though. When I was five to eight, 
I absolutely adored and I had idolized him. I thought he was the handsomest, the most talented, the smartest man on earth. When I turned nine, my view of him changed. I saw him with keener eyes, the eyes of a daughter who had been treated poorly. His nickname was Sonny Boy because he was the promise of his family. His mother and sisters all doted on him. He was an amazing pianist. When he walked into a room, he brought the party with him. He would sit down at the piano and everyone gathered around to sing. When I joined in, he would tell me, stop singing because I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I absorbed his words wholly because he was my one and only father. And as a girl, I looked up to him. He was right. Therefore, everything about me was wrong. I believe what my father believed. And that was, I was U-G-L-Y, ugly. My father never set the record state. He never apologized for this cruel joke. He was completely okay when the hurt, that the hurt he heaped on me. Later in life, he would ask why I did not like him. I did not have a, the sense of agency at the time to tell him, I don't like you because you bullied and threatened me every chance you got. I was often sullen around him. When he, when he was in his jabby moods, I often escaped into one of my books in my room. I came from a family of soldiers and athletes. They made fun of my retreat into reading. Though I loved my family, I often felt, felt ill-suited as I was the only one who read voraciously. The verbal bullying for reading and for writing often became tiresome. I was misunderstood and completely lonely. Authors and books became my best friends. Through Angelou and Giovanni and Bloom and countless others, I found solace in the meeting of minds. When I turned the pages, books helped me carry the weight of being neglected and verbally abused. They could not take away the pain that went deep down to my core, but they did provide shelter. Books provided an exit strategy out of Piedmont, South Carolina, also a livelihood. I became a poet and a teaching artist. I was studying my craft through reading. I was on my way to becoming a wordsmith. My father saw me as a weak link, as in the family chain, because I was highly sensitive. He did not stop on that day. He found every opportunity to jab and batter my psyche. I carried a legacy of shame. On top of that, we had a family friend who often followed my father's lead. She spoke to me only to find something wrong with me. Wipe your nose, your knees are ashy, your breath smells. I was nine and barraged by adult bullies. What I felt about myself, was shaped by those terrible moments. When I looked in the mirror, I saw my mud ugly self. Who does that to a daughter? Who lets friends talk to a child that way? How I learned to dance and read the weather. On eggshells I dance, grooves to fit my father's moods, tap dance, bebop, dirge. Every day I had to fight and defend myself from my father. Looking back, I now understand the weight of his words and how they affected me. I took that paternal hit that day and I've been carrying that wound ever since. When we moved to the South, I encountered the color line in the black community for the first time. The paper bag rule still existed. I was darker than the paper bag, so I was not deemed pretty. Both blacks and whites always pointed out my dark skin. I found it preposterous and ridiculous that people still abided by these color struck ways and it ran rampant in my own family over the color, color line. It is strange how the stories moved down the family tunnel with mouths barely open, how lore still warmed its way, buried itself deep into our pockets like unspent coins. I carry the load. One especially, how, my how many of my daddy's people never liked mama, how they loathed her dark skin and fly away hair. But daddy planted both defiant feet, three hues over the paper bag test, married mom anyway. That's how I got here in all my dark presence, shining like mama. I always thought well of daddy and the ground he took until my bro brother brought a yellow gal with so call good hair home. Father congratulated him. You got you a good one, son. Was my father crossing toward me or was it away? 
we were so far apart, never heard an I love you or you're pretty. I carry the weight of what my father never said. My dad was warped and it took me many years to untangle myself from his ugly threads. His verbal lashings only got worse as I got older. I saw what my dad saw, a mud puddle. When I look back, I was not ugly. I was a brown button of a girl with the white, widest and whitest of eyes who should have been scooped up in love. Instead, my father handed me hate on that day and many other days. This is where the self-loathing originated. I'm not sure what happened to my father in his childhood for him to be able to unleash such vitriol on a nine-year-old, but it must have been horrific. I went to college, the first in my family to finish. My father tried to interfere in my college endeavors as well. While at home on the weekend, he drunkenly stumbled into the kitchen while I was taking plates out of the cabinet. He came in and yelled, you ain't never gonna be nothing. I came down off the ladder that I was on and told him, look, old man, you have run every one of your children out of this house and I'm not leaving until I get my college degree. I felt like sea leaf from the color purple, pointing my hoodoo fingers at Albert. I curse you until you do right by me. Everything you think about is gonna crumble. My father's gaze like Albert's attitude towards Seely. You're black, you're poor, you're ugly, you're a woman, you ain't nothing at all. After my retort, my dad sobered up quickly. He walked away. This was the beginning of me speaking up for myself. This was me reclaiming my power. During my senior year in college, things improved. I was further away from my house in my father's reign. I acted in college plays, edit, edited the literary magazine. I belonged to the Black Student Union and served as a student life assistant. I became engaged to my now ex-husband, Blaine Shearer. He convinced me then to enter the Miss Arrow pageant at Erskine College in, eight, in 1985. His words carried a lot of weight with me. He was the first man who asked me, you don't know, do you? Know what? That you're beautiful. I asked him, really? His words were crystal, crystal clear water. I began looking in the mirror differently, looking in the mirror without my father's mud colored perspective. I kind of knew I was striking. I did not have many mirrors in my life reflecting beauty back the television, commercials, magazines, and people in my circle said otherwise. Ongoing, I had other cheers in my head from cheerleading days. Be aggressive, be aggressive, B-E-A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E, -E -S -S -E. be aggressive. And I was going after my college degree, trying to change my station in life, going to college was my way out. When I go, when I go to Erskine in due west, South Carolina, I did not, party. I was serious. I was about the business of college. I was about the business of uplifting myself. Peer pressure had no weight with me. My peers had no idea the weight that I carried. Education was my way out. My senior psychology project was about the attitude and perceptions of black, beauty of Black women. I hypothesized that people on campus would believe that Black women who were lighter would be deemed more attractive than dark-skinned ones. My, my hypothesis yielded what I proposed. I entered the, Miss, the Erskine College Miss Arrow pageant, though I vowed never to enter another one because of the rig one that I had during high school. Blaine told me it was a new day. He pleaded for me, me to just try it. I relented, I entered and did so with a grain of salt about winning. During the pageant, I was carefree and had no, um, I had no ideas of winning. I just threw my whole self in. I shot with my mother on the weekends back at home at Hayward Mall for my pageant clothes. We rubbed our few coins together. She was a factory worker at 3M. We bought my casual wear at Casual Corner. We bought my evening gown at five, seven, and nine. We spent less than $200. I was up against people who paid $500 plus for their gowns alone. Ironically, there was no talent portion in the pageant. Instead, there was an interview. Double irony, I did well during the interview portion because I had the gift of gab from my dad. I used this gift and my expansive vocabulary that I gained because I was a voracious reader. I read to excess, I read to escape. What made me different in high school allowed me to excel in college. I was already a budding poet. I 
talked the panel to the panel of judges like the poet and teaching artist I was to become. I talked about wanting to make a better world as a counselor. I recited lines from books. I recited poetry. I walked out of there knowing I had done my best with both my heart and my mouth. I also look incredible in the blue silk dress with matching belt that cinched my 24 inch waist. When I walked down the runway, I did it with the grace of a dancer. Every skill that I had learned from flash dance, Broadway, the TV show, fame, and music videos came into play as well. I made eye contact with the judges and the audience. When they announced my number 23 and my name is the winner, I stood in shock backstage. Someone had to tell me, that's you. I looked down at my number. They were right. I erupted in shock and then into the ugly cry. Brows furrowed, hands cupped over my mouth. I wept uncontrollably. One of my male classmates told me, you should not cry like that. What did he know? He had no idea the years of shame that I had been holding back. I cried for the time my dad told me my eyes were ugly. I cried for the time when he, we moved to the South when my dad retired. Many of my peers, both black and white, told me I was too dark to be beautiful. For my senior psychology project on attitudes of black women based on skin tones with African and Anglo-Saxon uh, figures, I had people choose who they thought was the most beautiful. On a predominantly white campus, students picked light-skinned women with European facial traits. It proved my point about the latent biases against dark-skinned women. This was the beginning of my social activism phase. Winning was the most wonderful, unexpected moment of my life up to that point. It also was my loneliest. It seemed the only two people in my inner circle happy for me were Blaine and my mother. I spent the evening alone in my room because no one wanted to celebrate my victory. This was the night that I learned that winning was not all it was cracked up to be. The wife of the president of Erskine College sent word through a friend that I would be, I should be honored to have won the title. I am not sure what I said, but I know what I thought. No, it was Erskine College that should be proud. It was 1985 and I was the first black Miss Arrow. The crown, the crown weighed heavily because so many people on campus did not believe it belonged to me. The soccer coach sent me congratulations. My psychology professor told me the beauty pageant was a true beauty pageant because it was based on deeper standards when they chose me. Also a classmate came to, sh to show me the write up of the pageant. He said they put it next to the cow exchange. He really thought it was funny and told me, one of the white girls should have won. Only a few people were happy that I won. Yet even with these put downs, downs, I knew I had something more than a beauty pageant win. I began to look inward for my validation. In 1989, when I gave birth to our twin daughters, Amber and Celeste, my world widened. I remember looking into their eyes. I saw two beings who expanded my heart. I got a counselor to help me deal with the wounds I carried from having an abusive father. I worked on myself to transfer that pain into poetry. I knew that I would always tell them that they were beautiful and bright. I felt the profession, I left the profession of counseling. I began reading and writing poetry to face my wounds. Poetry became one of the tools that I used to affirm myself and to combat his hate. I wrote my way out. I used Louise Hayes' You Can Heal Your Life and Shakti Gawan's work, and I finessed my own healing mantras like, you are a divine light fueled by the divine. You shine bright in all things you need, health, wealth, and all things creative. I said it 10 to 30 times a day. I began to radiate with positivity on the inside out. I truly began to love myself. It showed in everything I did. I did not need a pageant to validate me, but it felt like it was mine to win because by the time I enter, I was detached from winning. I won on my own merits. I was beautiful before the crown. I am beautiful now with my head shorn with multiple myeloma, no wigs, maybe a skull cap or an African wrap to keep me warm. Today, I keep my eye on what is truly important, loving myself as myself. Eventually, I became a poet and teaching artist. This is my 27th year traveling the country and the world. 
I teach others to love themselves through poetry. This is my wound turned into mission. This is my call. Confront the past and alchemize pain into beauty. Cage bird sings, honoring Maya Angelou. Cage bird sing cause she's born bound. Belts blues through shut doors with throat open wide, sings raw truth. Sings because singing be better than weeping. Ask Billy, ask Nina. Sings cause sky calls and she's more wild than Cage. So she beats wings against bars, find music and pen upon paper, upon heart. She sings cause her dark skin mirrors the night sky. Deep down, she knows not everyone loves her back. Not everyone loves her black velvet contrast against moonshine. Knows her full lip and fuller nose in this white world be a choir taste. She sings because she can't erase Ron Clark's doll experiment circa 1950, proves what everybody knows. White ch child picks white doll. Black child picks white doll. Still. She sings because Stamps, Arkansas and Sumter, South Carolina holds Black girls the same way, dome squashed with low expectation. Cage birth scenes because her broken wing hurt did not begin with her. Been passed down, she comes from a long line of birds who cannot fly. Cage bird sings because she needs exit strategies, strategies. Reads Maya Angelou books like road maps till she's caged no more. Cage bird conducts her own experiment. Instead of dolls, black girl chooses black woman self, takes her likeness off the shelf. Each song she sings mantra-like affirmations, recites them over and over and over again. Phenomenal woman, phenomenally, until she believes she sings that's me, that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glennis, for that wonderful essay. That was beautiful, thank you for sharing. Hi everyone, my name is Bethany Holmes and I am an editorial assistant with NCLR. Next up, we have the winner of the 2020 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize, Andrew D. Scrimger. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Authors Guild Bulletin, and The Moment, Wild, Poignant, Life-Changing Stories. He serves as Dean of Libraries Emeritus for Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. He is currently working on a full-length biography of Robert W. Funk, the subject of his award-winning essay. Regarding his selection of this essay for the prize, final judge, Philip Gerard said that the piece demonstrates a storyteller's eye for detail and significant action, and that the rating is fluent and restrained, vivid and full of an unusual kind of suspense. Here to read from his 2020 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize story, Trouble in the Heartland, please welcome Andrew D. Scrimger. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be on the same program with Hannah and Glennis. And as I've heard these two pieces, I have to remark that they truly know the difference between being poignant and sentimental. They don't compromise their prose by sentimentality. That's a sign of gifted writers, don't you think? The title of my piece is Trouble in the Heartland. Robert Funk was nervous. His wife and a few friends were beside him, keeping the conversation light, hoping to distract him as they walked past the red brick buildings of Capitol University in Columbus, Ohio. It was the evening of March 27, 1998, and they were headed to Mies Auditorium, where Funk was scheduled to give the keynote address for the Ohio Academy of Religion a regional association of scholars teaching in the field of religious studies. The event was open to the public. A local radio station, as well as the major newspaper of the capital city had given Funk's visit top billing that day. 
Since Funk founded the controversial Jesus Seminar 13 years earlier, virtually no other person in religion except the Pope had attracted as much sustained attention from the American media. A few days before his arrival in Columbus, the Jesus Seminar had published its second big report, The Acts of Jesus, The Search for the Authentic Deeds of Jesus. The, the media immediately fanned the blaze of controversy, giving headlines to the fact that the scholars had judged the gospel stories about Jesus as largely fiction. That morning in Ohio, the Columbus Dispatch ran a lead article and Funk and the Jesus Seminar with the sensational and misleading title, Scholars Plan Audacious New Testament Rewrite. A sizable crowd was expected. The purpose of the Jesus Seminar was to determine what can be known about the life and work of Jesus solely on the basis of historical research. That is, apart from any interpretation based on religious faith and to share that research directly with the public. By design, it was not sponsored by any university, church, or religious organization. It was independent. Some 75 scholars with impeccable credentials constituted the core working group. After debating the results of their research reports, they voted in public on whether or not Jesus actually said or did the things attributed to him in the four gospels. Adding fuel to the fire, they voted by dropping colored beads in a box. A red bead meant Jesus said the words attributed to him. Pink meant that it was likely that he said something close to it. Gray, not his words, but close to his ideas. And black, he didn't say it. This practice fascinated and infuriated scholars and lay people alike. To some, it made vivid the careful way the scholars were evaluating the layers of tradition in the text. But to others, it was a blasphemous roadshow act besmirching holy writ. As a distinguished scholar of the Bible and popular speaker, Funk was a veteran of the lecture circuit and had delivered scores of talks across the country to audiences of diverse biblical views. The prospect of an audience of 900 people was not the reason he was apprehensive, nor was it the content of his speech titled, The Problem and Promise of the Historical Jesus. He had delivered it many times. Yet this early spring more evening was different from any of his other visits to a university campus. Funk could feel the tension among his friends. Despite their well-intended banter, a sense of foreboding had engulfed them like a Lake Michigan fog. That worry was reflected in the two strangers who accompanied him and his small entourage in the twilight. The two strangers were not his hosts from the university or officers of the Ohio Academy of Religion, nor were they biblical scholars or faculty of any field of study. Rather, they were men in blue, police officers from the Columbus Police Department. Like mobile bookends, they flanked him as the group made its way across campus, badges on their chests, service revolvers on their hips, their eyes on alert, probing the shadows that hugged the campus buildings. He had never needed a police escort before. While the research of the Jesus Seminar on Biblical Texts stirred deep emotion and debate, he had generally been accorded the civility reflected in the invitation from the Biblical book of Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. But earlier in the day, those words were spurned. The university received phone calls threatening Funk's life. Anonymous callers demanded Funk be banned from speaking that evening or harm would come to him. News soon followed that busloads of protesters from fundamentalist churches in the area, including the World Harvest Church, a megachurch led by TV evangelist Rod Parsley, 
were coming to swell the ranks of anti-funk forces. School officials not wanting to tempt fate, yet not willing to compromise academic freedom, took precautions to ensure funk safety as well as those attending the lecture. Without delay, they called the Columbus Police Department. Police quickly arrived to bolster campus security. Two of them were now his bodyguards. Funk was probably too preoccupied to notice that his group passed near a life-size statue of Martin Luther, a man who knew a thing or two about stirring things up when it came to the interpretation of scripture. But before Funk's party could spot the auditorium, they heard the sounds of an agitated crowd. As they turned the corner, they saw scores of people milling about the building. Some of them carried picket signs denouncing Funk. Words like, you have destroyed the Bible, heretic, and the wages of sin is death. One sign reflected the Lutheran heritage of Capital University and accused Funk of disrespecting Luther's Bible. The protester, apparently unaware that Luther himself held some unorthodox views on scripture, one being, Luther did not believe the books of James and Revelation belonged in the New Testament. When the crowd spotted Funk, men with bullhorns began blasting invectives. You're demon possessed, Dr. Funk. You're a blasphemer. You're going to hell. Repent before it's too late. <coughs> the picketers jeered, adding their own taunts, then attempted to block the entrance to the auditorium. The police ordered them to give way and the guest speaker and his companions were able to walk through the crowd and into the building. At 7.30 p.m., the MC endeavored to bring the crowd to order, but the rancor continued as sections of the audience behaved more like football fans fueled by beer and zeal than people wanting to learn about the historical Jesus. Intoxicated, they were but under the influence of a much stronger drink, the liquor of anger. Pleas for order from the platform went unheeded. The presence of armed guards on the stage and at the exits did not dial down the din of catcalls and chants. When Mark Allen Powell, the professor chosen to introduce Funk was finally able to rein in the arena charged atmosphere, he abandoned his script and said, Robert Funk is a man who gets people stirred up over things that matter. When Funk finally stood at the podium, he followed Powell's lead and ad-libbed. His first words, praising the protesters for exercising their First Amendment liberties and making their views known. But now, he said, it was his turn. Obligingly, the crowd settled down. So Funk began. The quest of the historical Jesus is the pursuit of the discrepancy between the historical figure and the portraits of him in the gospels. The problem is to distinguish fact from fiction in the 22 ancient gospels that contain reports about what he said and did. Funk could hear some in the audience gasp as they heard the word fiction and learned possibly for the first time that many gospels were revered by the early Christian communities in addition to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nevertheless, he pressed on. The quest is essentially a search for reliable data. The popular view is that Jesus did and said everything that is reported of him in the four New Testament gospels. After more than two centuries of critical work, we know that is not true. The New Testament gospels are a mixture of folk memories and creative storytelling. There is very little hard history. Before he could continue, a middle-aged man seated near the front jumped to his feet. Stop, he cried, I can't allow you to do this. Immediately, the police officers stiffened, hands on their holsters. I've been praying all day what to do, 
and God told me I had to stop you from speaking, he said. Clutching a large Bible, he launched into a divinely ordained filibuster, passionately quoting scripture, verse after verse. Like-minded partisans, particularly those who sat in the front rows of the balcony, applauded and roared their approval. When the man refused to take his seat, the police moved to his row, arrested him, and as the crowd booed, escorted him out of the auditorium. When order was restored, Funk worked hard to regain both his composure and the attention of his audience. 50 minutes later, he completed his talk and said, if you have questions or comments about anything I've said, I'd be happy to hear them. Immediately, there was a rush to the microphones that were stationed in the main aisles, but hope for a thoughtful conversation quickly evaporated as it became apparent that the protesters had outmaneuvered the university and seminary students who wanted to seriously engage with Funk. The protesters now outnumbered them in the lineup at the microphones. While there were some questions from people who wanted to understand the approach of the Jesus Seminar, they were in the minority. Squinting through the harsh lights of the stage to locate his inquisitors, Funk responded thoughtfully to each comment or question. But as one person reported, Funk was repeatedly told he was possessed by a demon and that he was going to hell. Nevertheless, through the ordeal, he tried calmly to identify himself as a historian, as a scholar, as a seeker after truth, as one who simply wanted to discover what could be known. But people booed, tried to shout him down. He almost lost his temper twice, but only almost, end of quote. Many people did not ask a question at all, but gave their personal testimonies of faith imploring him to give his heart and mind to Jesus. One young man told a story of how he'd been rescued from drug addiction and a life of crime. What changed me, he wanted to know. In frustration, if not in irritation, Funk exclaimed several times, this is not a revival meeting. It's supposed to be a scholarly meeting. When the event was finally over, Funk did not mingle with the crowd, but was escorted to a reception in the Stegbola room next door in the Kearns Religious Life Center. That time of light refreshment and conversation was not open to the public, and Funk began to relax with friends and colleagues. Some of them undoubtedly recalled Funk's prescient words at the very first meeting of the Jesus Seminar, quote, what we are about takes courage. We are probing what is most sacred to millions and hence will constantly border on blasphemy. We must be prepared to forbear the hostility we shall provoke. But he didn't stop there. At the same time, he continued, our work, if carefully and thoughtfully wrought, will spell liberty for other millions. It is for the latter that we labor. Later, some of them headed over to the porch of the holiday wine shop on Main Street, where stronger drink, more to the liking of Martin Luther, was served. There, the evening was quietly recapped as the stars took up the watch, the vigilant men in uniform no longer needed. That picture of Funk as an embattled diplomat for a critical historical understanding of Jesus lingered long in the minds of many who attended the lecture, opening them unexpectedly to new ways of understanding the texts of their well-worn Bibles. That picture of Funk served to counter the media's frequent portrayal of Funk as a bowl in the China closet of faith. It also provided vivid documentation that despite intense opposition, the goal of the Jesus Seminar was being achieved, taking things that matter out of the academic vault and straight to Main Street America. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, that was excellent. And again, we invite you to subscribe to read this essay in its entirety. 
which will be published in the 30th print issue due out this summer. Thank you to Glennis Redmond and Tan Hannah Towie also. At this moment, we would really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to answer a quick poll question before our Q&A with our authors. Now we will open the floor up for questions to our authors. We will start with some of our editorial staff's questions. While you at home think of the questions that you would like to ask. You can place those questions in the chat box, or if you'd like to ask yourself, you can chime in whenever there's a free moment. Our first question is for all of the writers who read this evening. Readers might have noticed that none of you are actually from North Carolina. But we do define North Carolina writer broadly, as I mentioned, you don't need to be from here to be a North Carolina writing community member. So we are wondering how your time here in North Carolina is influencing or has influenced your writing. I, I can answer. Uh, I live in South Carolina. Uh, and I started writing in South Carolina, but I got my poetic wings in Asheville, North Carolina. I lived there for seven, 17 years and I consider myself bi-Carolinian. And so all of my work is, uh, I, it goes across the Carolinas. It's rooted in South Carolina, but a lot of my, um, a lot of my work is flavored by unearthing, especially African-American stories. Um, I have family in both, both Carolinas. I like back Carolinian, that's good. <laughs> I've been in North Carolina now uh, six years. Uh, and what I have found is that the writer community of North Carolina is large and supportive and operate as colleagues rather than as rivals of each other. Uh, and this uh, piece that I read tonight is uh, uh, intended to be the first chapter of the biography of Funk. And it, it bears the fingerprints of people like Margaret on it because we were together in a workshop a year and a half ago uh, in Asheville, uh, the fall meeting of the uh, North Carolina Writers Network. And that's just an example of the incredible uh, influence of writers uh, on me and influencing me and, in, and encouraging me. It's a great state in which to be a writer. Yeah, I totally agree. I've so I've only been here for the past four years. I'm in my senior year at UNC Chapel Hill and um, I've really experienced the state more through the eyes of a journalist and just the diversity of stories I've been so grateful to be able to come across and tell from, you know, Siler City and Danville, the more rural parts of the state um, to Chapel Hill and Durham. Um, it, everyone's just always so welcoming and I've learned a lot um, from living in a state that's much different from my own. Um, I definitely fell in love with North Carolina more than I was expecting to. <laughs> I agree. North Carolina is a good place. The older I get, the more I like it. Um, Let me so jump in for a second, Mary. Uh -huh. um, uh, I did want to say, since Andy mentioned we were in a workshop together, I want to tell everybody, I have nothing to do with contest results. I watch from the sidelines, and I don't even manage the contest. The students that are uh, working with you tonight, Mary, in fact, is managing right now the Albright contest for 2021, and I have had no part in it. So uh, I love watching from the sidelines. I love seeing who comes in and, and, and peeking at who made it to the finalists, putting the stories and everything together but um and then and then going wow I know this person and then when I started reading Andy's prize story after Philip Gerard picked it I remember thinking that's familiar to me I've seen that before <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was the first time I read it was after Philip sent me the title and said and I matched it up to the to the name speaking of Andrew's story 
We have a question that says, how did you encounter this story and what made you write about it? Um, the early part of my career, I was a theological librarian. My graduate degrees are in addition to uh, information science in theology and biblical studies. Um, and as I was making my way as a young professional at Harvard, I got a call from Robert Funk. And at, at that time, he was with the Society of Biblical Literature and had founded a, uh, a press called Scholars Press. And uh, I was part of a consortium of theological libraries that was doing a lot of technical uh, experimentation. And he, he invited me to a, uh, uh, a gathering of scholars and publishers uh, in Chicago. And that's how and that's how we met. And some years later, um, many years later, um, he invited me to be on the board of West Star Institute, the think tank that he had created. And the 20th anniversary of the Jesus Seminar uh, was a year or so away. And he asked me if I would give a plenary address on that occasion, answering the question, what has been the influence of the Jesus Seminar? And so I did that, and I gave my talk as uh, I was supposed to, but there was one problem. Bob Funk was not on the dais to introduce me. He had died six weeks earlier, and that event turned from one of celebration into, into one of mourning for uh, its leader. And on the plane going back, uh, I realized that uh, a biography really needed to be written about this man and this incredible uh, Jesus seminar. And in preparing for it, there were a lot of unanswered questions that were sort of like pebbles in my shoe. And so that's how I got into the project. So. Okay, for Glennis. How did the experiences you discuss in your essay and your use of writing to heal shape you as an educator? Um, I feel like my writing has always been a way, a tool for me to look within. Uh, my writing is normally poetry, but in the last 10 years, after graduating from Warren Wilson, I started writing essays, which I hated at the time. And now I am working on a book called The Darker Berry, A Black Woman's Observation of Living in a White World. And this is one of the essays and it's actually the hardest essay. And I don't know why I chose to read it because it is um, probably the most vulnerable piece I think I've ever written poetry or prose and but at the same time I think the vulnerability is a tool which is as a teaching artist is one of the things that I teach across the country for my students adult and um, teenage so I ask them to uh, go within and write so it's one of the lifelines that saved me uh, I always see my work as and, and you know I mentioned reading a lot in that essay and really, I believe that reading is what saved my life in many ways. And my mama, who doesn't really, usually she's first and foremost in all my work, but I'm like looking at my dad um, in our complicated relationship. He's been gone for uh, 17 years. But I, you know, just to, um, it, I don't write to exploit or harm, but I write to heal and I want to write something that's keenly crafted, but also has a healing mechanism um, a part of that. I think that's a throwback to my counseling days. I'm forever a counselor as a poet and an essayist. So that's how I think I'm impacted by um, not just writing, but, uh, you know, as I said, other authors who I'd never met who saved my life. And I think Lucille Clifton probably was the one who did most for me uh, when she was talking to Bill Moyers at the Language of Life. Um, festival in that end of her uh, iconic poem, you know, something um, has tried to kill me every day, but has failed. And uh, I think every day I wake up, that's my mantra when I go to uh, put pen to paper and to heart. 
I love that you mentioned that you kind of weave it all into your writing. I like that a lot. Yeah. And it feels like I'm trying to do, you know, it's, you know, you can tell that I'm doing lyric, lyrical essays. So it's always scattered with poems and, you know, it's not linear by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I just find some freedom in that. And um, it, it is, it's like a, my mother, I, you know, like I said, she was a seamstress. So I feel like I do what, what she does, but only with, with words. I yeah. Wish. With pen and paper. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Hannah, we have one for you too. How does your creative writing process differ from your journalistic one? And how does your environment interact generally with your writing? Yeah, I was trying to think about this when I saw it come in the chat. Um, I think my journalism and my creative writing are really synergistic with each other. And I think my best pieces borrow strengths from both mediums, my like creative writing borrowing that research and, you know, interviewing my family. Um, and then my journalism, when you, you sort of go beyond the traditional inverted pyramid type style that they drill into you in J school. Um, so I love doing both. Um, creative writing for me, especially the essay, which um, is my preferred uh, method of creative writing, but also the most challenging for me. Um, borrows a lot from journalism and it's a lot more immersive um, and emotional for me and takes a lot longer. Um, but intellectually, I love it. Um, it's like a puzzle piece putting it all together. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I don't have like a checklist for either. I think they really work best um, together. And then the second question, my environment, like um, nature, like, is that what the question's referencing? Like the physical environment? Um, yeah, so I am definitely really inspired by um, my family's homes in Cape Cod um, and the history of that area um, in a lot of my work, especially I've always grown up um, near the ocean and that means a lot to me like poetically and spiritually. And um, I think I get a lot of energy from the coastal community that I'm from. Um, so yeah, I think my favorite kind of writing that I do personally is um, somewhat reflective on the nature all around us um, and the harm that we're doing to it. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I can't speak for all North Carolina writers, but I think a lot of North Carolina writers take inspiration from nature too, since we have the beach and the mountains and we kind of have a little bit of everything. So. Um, thank you to everyone who sent in a question for our authors, but unfortunately our time is limited and we'll now wrap up our Q&A with one last question. And this is for everyone. So why are you compelled to share your work or what compelled you to share your work, if anything specific? I guess writing for me is a way to uh, figure out what I know. Um, it's a way for me to try to bring to words things that mystify me. Um, um, and then in the process of, of writing, you wanna know whether it resonates with other people. So you try it out on your family and friends and then they encourage you to submit it to, uh, to larger, larger audiences. But I would write if I never published. I mean, it just, I, I just have to, I have to write. And when I get an audience, I mean, that's just putting the maraschino cherry, you know, on the Sunday, so. Um, I think I always uh, fall back on what I tell my students with poetry, you know, um, I think, I believe it was June Jordan who said, you know, there are three lies to poetry. First, when you read it, 
second when you write it and the third is when you speak it to life and I think there's a certain magic when the work goes out to others and I don't know if it was in the English patient or what book it was where we said you know we read to know we're not alone and I think publishing and um speaking out is about connections for me even if it's really hard work I just believe that we gain this community through sharing our work. I know in my early days of writing and publishing, I, you know, through journals like um, uh, NCLR and other journals across the country, I had this vast community of people um, just through journals. I had it through performances and readings and all of that. So I think there's a power to the voice. It charges the air, whether it's through publication on page or through a uh, reading um, through Zoom <laughs> and or or live but I think you know I tell my students you know you know even if your voice is shaking you know share your work because there's you're speaking for so many others in your building community um yeah I've never really shared my creative writing outside of this so it was very nerve-wracking um <laughs> but it's awesome and I think when I first wrote that essay and sent it to my family and friends, it meant the most to me with my family, particularly sort of this unspoken grief that is being verbalized and you're seeing how it connects to, you know, history and the land that we're from and the Ospreys, you know, there's all these little connections that people don't talk about. Um, and so that was, the most rewarding um, for me when I shared with my family and then friends, you know, who had also lost grandparents recently, them um, seeing their own grieving process reflect in um, my work. Um, and yeah, I want to get better at uh, presenting and speaking because it is really amazing when you have a great reading. And um, I loved what you said, Glennis, about the voice charging your words. So yeah, hopefully. Thank you. And kudos to this being your first reading. It was amazing. I, I'm just honored to be on panel with both of you and NCLR and all of you who made this happen. It was beautiful. I mean, I you know, just not to take these moments for granted and to listen to the work tonight was just like, you know, you, could, you feel the universal thread of, of grief through um, all the stories. And so uh, that's what writers bring and that's what the people behind to make this happen. It just, I don't know, it's, it, it is spiritual in a sense, you know, it's powerful. And then the birds, <laughs> all the birds. <laughs> if I could jump in for a second, I just wanted to say, you know, Glennis is a, a, a member of our family for a while now. We've published our poems in a few issues. We had an interview with her in 2019. So I wanted to welcome, um, Hannah and Andy to the family. This was their first NCLR publication. So we're, we're one big happy family here. Um, I also noticed in the audience and I wanted to call, you know, Janice Harrington has a poem in the online issue that we're celebrating today and she's here. So welcome Janice and thank you for submitting. And Nancy Willard is a short story uh, say, that's also in the online issue. So these were um, finalists and honorable mentions in the um, in the in those contests and we will have a poetry reading in the spring and we'll have a, um, the the short story reading next fall when we're doing the Doris Betts contest we'll bring the winners of those um, in for a reading so uh, and, and you know we may continue to do some of this online to bring people from far and wide um, uh, even even when hopefully we can also be face to face again but I just wanted to thank them and thank the students, but I'm going to let them finish the program now. This is their, their thing, but I just want to thank everybody and say welcome to the family. And hey, there's nothing stopping any of y'all from submitting again. We don't have any rules about submitting two years in a row. Thank you, thank you to our authors for their wonderful work tonight. And thank you for our viewers for tuning in and supporting NCLR. Before we say our goodbyes, the Alumni Association would ask if you would just take one more quick second to fill out a poll if you haven't already. And if you'd like to keep up to date on all of our events and contests, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Authors who are watching, remember to submit to the Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize competition. Once again, the deadline is March 1st. For submissions information, go to our website at www 
www.nclr.ecu.edu and click on submissions. If you submit to the Alex Albright competition this week, then send us an email saying you attended this event. You can receive a free copy of the 2019 issue featuring an interview with Glennis Redman. On our homepage, you can view the new 2021 online issue to read Glennis and Hannah's stories and more. Remember, if you subscribe this week for the print issue, send us proof of your new or renewed subscription, and we'll send you a free 2007 issue featuring 100 years of writers and writing at ECU. Thank you again for watching, and thank you to all of our authors, to our editors, and the Alumni Association. We wish you all health and wellness as we overcome the COVID-19 pandemic together. Good night.